On Security Weekly tonight, we have a special guest interview with Apollo Clark. He'll talk web application security, Kali Linux, and be mixing drinks live in studio. Get our take on listener-submitted Bash command line tips and tricks, and we'll cover some stories of the week, including more massive D-Link fail. All that and more on this edition of Security Weekly, making the world a better place, one episode at a time. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios here in Rhode Island, the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails, they flow steady. It's Paul Security Weekly! This episode is brought to you by Pony Express. Check out the Community Edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean, mean pen testing machine. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. And by Onapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical applications from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at Onapsis.com. And by Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. It's time to fire up a packet capture, pour yourself some sort of adult beverage, and get into the intern control of your botnet because here's a man who looks good in pink, but only in an Arizona prison. Paul Asadorian. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to this edition of Security Weekly. This is, in fact, episode number... Let me get my show notes ready. Sorry. Where did it go? 4.15. 4 4.15, and today is April 23rd in 2015. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. It's wonderful to be here this evening. I'm joined by my illustrious host, Mr. Larry Pesce, sitting to my right. Yes. Finally back from Orlando. Yes. Yes. Ooh. Special guest in studio, Apollo Clark is here, looking very dapper, by the way, mixing cocktails for tonight. And um, oh, yeah. <laughs> even though there's a crappy camera angle, he still he still looks good. It's good. <laughs> you, I'll just uh, you, you dress up, up the camera angle, Apollo. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. So uh, let me introduce the rest of the guests, and then we'll talk about our first cocktail that you made. Because I want to especially talk about the name because it's named in honor of Mr. Joff Thayer. Oh, g'day, Paul. How are you? G'day, everybody. It's great to be here again. And I want to give a big, big, big shout out for all of the fans that came up to me last week in Orlando and at B-Sides um, Orlando. It was terrific to see everybody. Lots of recognition. So glad glad you guys could uh, drop by and say hello whenever you did. He's new to this fanboy thing. <laughs> oh, his, his, <laughs> his first experience of fans <laughs> coming up to him in a conference kind of thing? Yep. yep. I got you. Um, on the lines via Skype, we also have Mr. Carlos Perez. Welcome, Carlos. Hey, Paul. Happy to be here. Yes. Nice to see you. You're in the same position every week, Carlos. I don't <laughs> know how you do it, but you look the same every week. It's very consistent. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Michael. Enable my video. <laughs> Mr. Michael Santar Cangelo is here. And I call Hi. him Cangelo because, you know, there's a, such a thing as Cangelo. That's like a thing, dude. It's a thing. It is a thing. Is. In fact, we have a picture of it. I don't know if they have it. <laughs> Apparently there. now it's There it is. Now. Look at that. Michael Santa Cangelo. <laughs> Look, it's I even labeled it with your name, Mike. You can't see that picture, but it's awesome. Oh. Trust me. It's got pineapple in it. It's, That's amazing. It's wonderful. That's amazing. I think what they're saying is it's fruit in your, your can is what. In any case, Mike, it's nice yeah. to have you on the show tonight. It's always nice to be here. Yes. Got so, fruit in your can? <laughs> uh, uh, Apollo. Yes. Thank you for coming down. You made the trek down from uh, Boston. Is that where you, you work and live? Did the old MBTA. Nice. nice. I actually worked today, too. It was nice. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> used air quotes when you said that, Apollo. I don't know. I hope your boss <laughs> isn't listening. <laughs> no, no, no. The MBTA The MBTA works. was functional oh, today. I see. Yeah. Um, so what is this drink? So I want, Well, let me preface this with. We put out a contest on the show, and I was like... Whoever can send us their favorite cocktail recipes, we'll pick the ones we like, and we'll give people a free T-shirt based on that. So I'm, I'm like, well, that, that was kind of cool. You know, we've been drinking cocktails here in the studio. We had to progress from beer to cocktails 
Jack was a big influence on that. Yep. But anyway, we and we found now, I find now that I go into a restaurant and there's very few beers on the menu that I have have not had. Yeah, mm. I, we we drank all the beers. Yep. We <laughs> so we had to switch things. cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> and so we solicited uh, listener responses. Now, one of the first responses we got was from Apollo. Oh, so really? see, you respond to oh, our well. contest and we put you on the show. That's how it works. Uh, not really, but Apollo <laughs> had an entry in custom tailored drinks. For several of the members of this illustrious cast and crew here on Security Weekly. So mine was, of course, the smoking hot Asadorian. I mean, what can I say? Um, look good in pink. And I look good <laughs> in pink. And Joff had his drink, which is what we're drinking now. And what did you name this drink, Apollo? This is the Joff Me Off. The Joff Me Off. Also I see. Known as a uh, a dirty Vesper, a dirty a dirty Vesper job. Uh, okay, Vesper. I just don't get it. Why do you get smoking hot? <laughs> and I get the dirty Vesper. Uh, or they me off. Well, see, you know what is, jo- it's the accent. Yeah, job. when everybody the accent's he- dirty, man. It's it went, dirty. And when everybody hears the accent, all the ladies they get dirty. And well, <clears throat> I want yeah. I want to give you a cocktail that's suitable for a man from down under. Yeah, uh, there you go. Well, well, look, I mean, you are speaking of the story of my life, after all. So the, the, the cocktail is well-named. Nice. Um, yeah, so I'll tell you about the history of the cocktail. Mm. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, it's actually the cocktail of James Bond, 007, oh. the Even finest better. pen tester in the world. Yes, see, it, Joff, it, see, Joff. It's called the Joff Me Off, but he named it after the, the finest pen tester in the world, mm-hmm. James Bond. Yeah, and they were, in fact, shaken, <laughs> not stirred. They were, yes, of course. They're very good. What is in this cocktail? It's delicious. It yeah, so delicious. what we ended up using was um, uh, Hendrix gin. So yep. it's a more of like a new world kind of gin. Mm-hmm. I like it because it's really floral. So you get a lot of juniper, a lot of citrus notes, but a lot of those kind of uh, uh, you know earthy kind of herbal notes out of it, which mm-hmm. is really nice. Uh, next, we use cold river vodka. And one of the big uh, misconceptions people have in America is that vodka is made with potatoes. Used to be. Not anymore. About 90% of the vodka we get nowadays in America is made with wheat. Hmm. So very neutral. Mm. But what's nice about Cold River, it's from Maine, so of course I'm going to like it, being from Maine. Um, but yeah, it has a really um, kind of round, has a really good mouthfeel to it. It's good, it's good straight, too. I, t- I tasted some before the yep. we mixed these cocktails. Yep. And now so. is it made with potatoes? Potatoes, yeah. Excellent. Actual Maine potatoes. potatoes. Yep. It's very good. It's very good. Like it. Yeah. So, so what I got out of that is the Joff Me Off is floral, herbal, earthy, and has a great mouthfeel. Yes. Mm-hmm. And okay. the catch Just is... Just glad I could frame that for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it feels good in your mouth, as, as you want most things to taste. <laughs> so. Let me tell you. <laughs> so next wow. we add in a splash of uh, Koki Americano. Now, the traditional recipe called <clears throat> for Smirnoff... Gordon's and Kina Lele. So Kina Lele is kind of like a white vermouth from France. The catch with that is that the recipe changed in 1985, 1986. Um, it became less bitter and more sweet. Now, Koki Americano is from the Koki, I believe it's the Koki town in Italy. And what's nice about that one is it's much more bitter, has a little, a lot less sweetness to it. And what is that? A liqueur of some kind? It's basically, yeah. What they do is they get some herbs and they combine it with... Um, I can't remember what the, exactly the wine is. It's basically like a white mm-hmm. white wine liquor, basically. Yeah, it looks mm-hmm. like white wine in the in the bottle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's really good to think of that as kind of like a white vermouth replacement. Mm. So a lot more complex flavors, really, really nice. So you add all that together, and then you throw in a really nice big peel of lemon. So that right there is just a straight Vesper. But you got to make it dirty. And yeah, you got to have a dirty Vesper. I exactly. agree. I like it dirty, too. I mean, if you're going to get joffed off... It's got to be dirty. It's got to be dirty. Hell yeah. Because yeah, it it's going to feel good in your mouth. Job is very dirty. <laughs> <laughs> I see you studied the culture of this show before you named the cocktail. I've been so. watching you guys for about a little over a year now. So Excellent. It's been fun. Oh, Excellent. wow. So, yeah, well, well played. Well played. I'm, I'm, I'm wise to your games, Paul. Yes, yes. Um, so you put the, the dirtiness is the pearl onions. Exactly, yeah. So when you add in um, the olive brine like that, it makes any kind of martini dirty. Um, most people, unfortunately, really don't like that, but... If you add it, again, it gives it a little more body. It gives it that mm-hmm. kind of saltiness to it. Yeah. And in a small amount, it's actually really nice. You know, it doesn't really compete with any of the flavors. The Joff Me Off does get a little salty. It, yeah, it cause, does. Cause, <laughs> and especially, you don't want a whole lot of salt in your mouth for the Joff Me yeah. So, again, <laughs> suitable, Joff. suitable cocktail. Um, but, yeah, so you have all those flavors coming together. You know, they're not competing. They're kind of layering on top of each other. Mm-hmm. Excellent. As, as, a, as a good Joff Me Off should. So. Wow. And pearl onions are just like pickled onions? Is that all they was Yeah, that's basically it. Yeah. You, can, you can find them. I can't remember the brand of it, but you actually find pearl onions aged in uh, vermouth. Mm. So that stuff's really good. I can't remember the name now, of the brand, I, though. 
I, I do want to see this the name of this drink spread into your local drinking establishment of choice. So Yes. Um, so people across the world, Joff, can order a Joff me off. That's right. That's right. I want it. I want it, at least if we can achieve this goal, perhaps this year sometime, if I'm in New England somewhere, I can go into a bar or pub and say, I would like a Joff me off. <laughs> <laughs> that means <laughs> I'll do what I can. And so the we're, we're going to have to take him to the Foxy Lady, huh? say, Yes, I'd be happy to oblige. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have to take him to the foxy lady or something like that. Yes. Nice. Um, so a couple of quick announcements: Ready to Learn Combat Firmware Analysis. Register for my two my Black Hat course, Embedded Device Security Assessments for the Rest of Us. A two day hosted class at Black Hat Las Vegas. Registration includes breakfast, lunch, access to the Black Hat briefings, business hall, sponsor workshops, sponsor sessions, and arsenal talks. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash iot to register today. Larry is teaching SANS Wireless 617 Ethical Hacking and Defense coming up in Austin, Texas, May 18th through the 23rd. Make sure you go register for that one. That's a SANS pen test extravaganza. There'll be all kinds of fun activities like beer drinking and capture the flag and hacking cities and yep. things like and that. Net, net wars and net all, yeah, wars. all that fun stuff. Then you're in Baltimore for SANS Fire in yep. June, and you're in Berlin, Berlin, Juma, Berlin in Germany. Germany. I need a few more jobs me off. Immediately yes. following You're Baltimore. Berlin, Berlin Jimity. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, we've got a couple of other courses coming up later this year as well that uh, have not yet been announced, but they've asked me if I'd teach. So Excellent. I think I counted I'm teaching seven times this year. Uh, so, Apollo, you are. Uh, where did you learn to bartend? It's just like a hobby? Yeah. So what's funny is um, after I left high school, I spent two years in New Hampshire on Lake Winnipesaukee. And I worked at uh, some of the bars there and everything. And that area has uh, some of the highest uh, retirees for the population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I didn't really, I was 18 at the time, didn't really know much about cocktails. But I'd have people come in and say, oh, I want a Sazerac. Mm. I want a Negroni. I want a Martini. And I'm like, I have no idea what those things are, but let's give it a try. And uh, it was nice because, you know, these people were usually 70 plus. So, you know, they really liked their cocktails. And after getting yelled at for a couple of months and being mm -hmm. told you're not doing it right, <laughs> You know, I slowly started to learn how to make the cocktails. And but you couldn't taste the cocktails. Oh, well, sure. Couldn't. <laughs> couldn't officially. <laughs> okay, moving right along. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got you to know the craft. That's so. right. <laughs> but, uh, well, yeah. you got to get the straw and you got to take a sip to make oh, exactly. sure it tastes right. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was really fun. You know, people, they were very, very particular. Uh, which for most people would be very frustrating, but I thought I saw it as more of like a learning experience. You know, I got to learn each of the customers and how they liked it. So I not only learned the old style cocktails, but also how to customize them for the people nice. that were taking them. So, That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so you work in Boston as a web developer. Yes. Uh, originally from Maine, as you said. Um, and when you're not adding new features, you're breaking them. On weekends, mm -hmm. you, as you say, you like to mix cocktails, automating your deployment pipeline. You remember the Boston OWASP chapter, Boston Security Meetup, and founder of the Boston Kali Linux Users Group, um, where anyone is interested and can learn pen testing for free. So now, uh, Paul, how did you get your start in technology? Like, you weren't always in security. Security kind of sounds like something that you uh, kind of dabble with as kind of like a dotted line to your developer. Security found me. Security found <laughs> We found you. <laughs> and at this point now... And your buggy code that had security <laughs> vulnerabilities most likely, right? So but how did you get your start in exactly. technology? Um, so that's the thing, too. You know, growing up, I was, you know, that nerdy kid that had computers. Uh, my father was, or I say is, a uh, CFO. So, you know, early 90s, you know, we always had those uh, computers around, you know, really nice laptops. And, you know, the whole idea was I like to play on them. I played my DOS games. You know, I played that one, if you guys can remember it, that old game with, like, the monkey throwing the banana. You had to, like, calculate the parabolic arc of it. <laughs> I think old, I do remember that one. DOS I, game. Yeah. yeah. It's funny. We're going to talk about a story that talks about funny monkeys as the hacking mechanism. Nice. A nice. video of funny monkeys. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's how I got started with it. You know, I was, like, oh, five, six years old at the time, mm -hmm. you know, just trying to play some video games. And, you know, I started learning how to do, you know, MS-DOS, do that and everything. And then I started getting a little more intense with it, you know, learning how do you do your master boot record? How do you fix the partitions? Um, so, yeah, so I did that all throughout uh, grade school, hit high school. This was early, yeah, like late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, like 1998, uh, GeoCities. Oh, yes. yeah. So I think Larry had a GeoCities account. I did. I did. Back in the day. Pretty awesome. Yep, because that was like the only place you could host a website for free. Mm-hmm. Now, well, how did you get, so how did security find you? Yeah, so about that. Um, I don't know, I mean, I was, you know, I was a bit of a script kitty back in high school, playing around the LAN, 
using Abel and Kane and Jack the Ripper and all that fun stuff. Just kind of yeah, messing around, basically. Nothing too, nothing too bad. So um, I got really lucky because I was able to learn C programming as a sophomore in high school. So nice. that really kind of set me on the path of, you know, making HTML pages is one thing, but doing real hardcore coding with C, that was really nice. So it got me, so that's how I kind of got my start, kind of interest with security in general, just messing around with computers. So um, how security found me, though, was I was working at a startup in Cambridge, you know, a small little thing, and we started seeing some weird activity on the system. We started realizing our mail queue is suddenly 10x bigger. And we don't have 10x more new users. <laughs> so that's kind of weird. So... I'm looking through the logs, and I'm like, what are we sending out? A whole lot of Viagra emails. Nice. <laughs> nice. So you got your start in security through Viagra emails. Yeah. It got me hard for security. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I see what you did there. And I really wish I hadn't seen wow. it. <laughs> so <laughs> what? So I, you, but you're primarily a developer. Exactly. Right? And so yep. what, what, do you, what web applications are you developing in? Like what languages? And uh, so right now I'm doing things uh, with my day job using uh, Python and Flask. Uh, a little bit of MongoDB, Postgres, and all that. Mm -hmm. um, on the side, I actually run a startup, a wine startup called Vino Discover. And that's written in PHP 5.6, I think, right now. It's either, either 5.4 or 5.6. Uh, and the Zen framework. So mm -hmm. it's really interesting because Python, really clean, really simple system. I, I love using it. <laughs> <laughs> set malfunction, set malfunction. <laughs> um, on the PHP side, though, it's really, really funny because I just came to this realization the past few years is as a language grows, it starts to look more like Java. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Seriously. Ooh. So true. Yeah, so PHP... Again, it's not as verbose as Java, but just syntactically, it's really starting to look like that. You know, Have you, you ever been approached by a semi-cute blonde chick at a conference that asks you if you want to, if you code in Java or not? <laughs> well, there's a lot of recruiters. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so anyways, so uh, so go ahead. I was what were you gonna? Oh you, right, yeah. You, so um, just doing both systems, you know, doing. I did PHP from uh, 2001 until about a year and a half ago. Uh, I was just full PHP the whole time. Hmm. Um, started using Python a little over a year ago now, and it's just really interesting using both systems because they have their own kind of personalities almost. So, um, so what do so you've hung out with a lot of developers, right? Yep. Uh, you know, do you have uh, partners in your startup? That you developed a website with? No, just me. Just just you. Just okay, me. but um, so but what do developers think of security people in general? I feel like you have a closer tie to that than maybe a lot of security people do. I try. I mean, I've been going to OWASP events for about three years now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I first was introduced to you guys last year at uh, B sides. Mm -hmm. nice. So you know, I've been going to the. I go to. I'll try to go to all the events I possibly can. And on the flip side, I also go to the developer events. And on the developer side, it's really interesting. Um, you guys are revered like magical wizards. Really? <laughs> yeah. You know, you guys are just the, oh my God, wait, that can do that? That's impossible. But you guys do it. But what's interesting is we revere you as wizards. Like, I could, uh, writing a compression algorithm, that's, that's awesome. Well, you, you got to go middle out first. That's right. Middle <laughs> out is definitely the, that's the way to go. That'll make sense when you watch Silicon Valley, Larry. Yes. Yeah, I haven't watched it yet. Yeah. That's what was the comment in the beginning of the show about making the world a better place. Is it uh, on Netflix? I don't, I don't think, think it's on so. Netflix. I think you gotta, you got to pay for it somewhere. I mean, it's on the internet. You'll oh, find yeah. it on the internet. Yeah, or you can find it on the internet. Yeah, so I'm told. yeah I mean... Yes. So, so I think we ought to be nicer to developers then. We've cracked on developers once in a while and... Only when stupid mistakes are made, though. I mean, you know. <laughs> but I feel like there's also the impression that us security people just get in the way of developers doing their jobs. There has to be that impression as well. <laughs> there's some of that, but, you know, the really smart developers that I've, that I've met, and there's That's plenty one. of them, uh, are, yes. are more excited to learn about, hey, what wizardry did you do to break that thing? Because I'd rather that not happen. I mean, there's plenty of those guys around. Yeah, I'd say that the majority of developers that I talk to about security... Um, I'd say less than 10% of them get scared and say, don't talk to me anymore. I don't want to know anything about this. Oh. Um, but I, again, the other 90% are like, like just Josh said, you know, that is amazing. Because we don't want to build bad software. We don't want to build things that break. Right. But so, so not only they say that's amazing, but they, they take it to heart and want to uh, make software better that doesn't have security flaws. That's kind of how I like to view developers like... You know, done some development myself, and I don't want to write bad software, and exactly. I want it to be secure. And really, those things go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so, that, so from Bell's perspective, you know, we love we they love to learn security. 
Um, I think what gets in the way of that to a degree I was going to say, wait, if every developer loves security, then why do we have insecure software? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's a catch. Hold on a second, Apollo. Something's wrong here. <laughs> why isn't the world perfect? <laughs> I, I, need, I need to drink some Joffme out there. Hold on. <laughs> To drink some drink Joff me everybody off. Drink. Everybody drink Joff me off. By order of Joff, everybody drink my off me off. <laughs> <laughs> everybody drink me off. <laughs> wow. That's a fantastic drink, too. Glad you like it. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Most people don't like it dirty, but clearly you do, Paul. I love it dirty. He loves it dirty. He's loved it dirty and for it's years. It's dribbling down his chin. That's why, I grew, that's why I grew a beard, so I could savor some of the dirty Joff me off. It's the flavor saver. <laughs> I keep sucking it out of my mustache. Mm. That's what she said. Stays with you. What Wait, were we what? talking about? Uh, developers. Why, why don't we <laughs> have... Developers, developers, developers. Why don't we have... Yeah, what, what gets in the code. way? What, what are these... Uh, I think... Uh, I think my theory is there's a lot of pressure to deliver. There's a lot of that software development lifecycle pressure to get it out, get, get it on the, on the shelf and, and pushed out to market. And, and security is often not included in that equation. That's my theory. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it really comes down to what are we incentivized to do? Um, I give talks about DevOps, and I talk about the problems of devs versus operations, which to a degree includes security. I feel like security is somewhere actually between the two of them, but anyways. Um, yeah, developers were, were paid to change the system and add new features. Mm -hmm. Operations and to a degree security professionals are incentivized to make things stable, not changing, and secure. Well, that just inherently is at odds with each other. So you just kind of have this culture clash of what is management and what are companies incentivizing us to do. So, exactly. Um, that's a lot of it. Um, the other part of it, too, is with some managers, p people I've worked with in the past, you know, they say, oh, you're doing security. Oh, okay, that's kind of nice, but it's not a requirement. Mm. So, you're ca they basically see it as you're just wasting my time. Hmm. Right. Um, the flip side to that one, which I've had a lot of success with, is treating security as a form of, uh, you know, fault tolerance detection. Because again, where do we find our bugs? It's always the edge cases. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can build, if you can say, well, we're not, we're doing security testing, but we're actually doing is fault injection, and you can tie that into the QA process. A little social engineering you're throwing in there. Bit. I like it. I like it. Yeah. I like it. Mike, did you have uh, questions for Apollo? I mean, along these well, lines. I know it's yeah. In fact, I mean, I actually love the direction that that you're going with this naturally. But so I look at it, and I and I, I'm I'm interested in in ways we can come together. In your experience, I know you you, you straddle the fence. But from a developer's side, what are the things that you've seen security people do where you say, yeah, that's it. That's good. Let's do more of that. Because I think if we can model some mm -hmm. scenarios for people, great. whether it was the approach, the <clears throat> language. Um, and, and then I got a follow-up question if it doesn't fit into it about the ability to, to build sh you know, better shared libraries and better code around things like authentication and stuff that we, we still struggle with. But that might be a secondary question. Mm. So what can we do? How, how do we make it easier for developers uh, to, to, to yeah. do what developers need to do, but better? You okay there, Paul? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fine. You said you could eat the onion. <laughs> he put, he put, he put, wow. He put those pearls in his mouth. And, uh, wow. wow. <laughs> that's yeah. like the equivalent of eating the worm, man. You're not supposed wow. to eat the worm. Yeah, that thing, woke too. up my senses. Well, the thing is, you think about what this cocktail is and why it suits James Bond. Mm. You're basically drinking pure booze right at this point. Gin and vodka. Yeah. <laughs> so those pearls, they'll, uh, they'll get to you. They're good. Wow. That was good. I Very wasn't expecting that. Not what you that. expected, huh? It was an explosion in my <laughs> mouth. This kind of the Joff me off exploded in your mouth. Exactly. <laughs> a little salty. And the thing is, that, that's the sign of a good cocktail right there. It grabs you by surprise. Mm. Um, but yeah, so back to the question. Um, so the things I've seen that are most efficient most effective are, it sounds stupidly simple, is writing malicious user stories. You know, a lot of developers now, we do huh. Agile, we do Scrum. <laughs> we do Agile, we do Scrum. And, uh, you know, a lot of us are working off ticket systems and user stories and use cases. Um, if you can write a user story that says, you know, Tom can log into the system, but should not be able to edit Mary's, you know, settings, yeah, we can work off that. Um, so that well, helps I mean, a lot. You, you heard my reaction just because you're right. That's deceptively simple. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. It, so is that the kind of thing then that needs to be highly specific to the application? Or is it the kind of thing then where we could collectively start to put together some, some base use cases that people then could build on and modify? I think both, yeah. You know, definitely having some generic use cases helps. Um, I can tell you right now, just from being a developer, is if you give me a use case or a user story that's too broad, it's effectively useless to me. 
If right. you say, you know, I want to input X, Y, Z, you know, let's say I want to put in a date, start date, end date. Well, you know, that could be something, that could, like the story I just said, you know, Tom should not be able to edit Mary's settings. Mm -hmm. Well, the devil's in the details, you know. How should that date be formatted? Are we talking year, month, day, right. just the year, year, month, day, date time stamp? Like, there's so many permutations of that. Um, that's what I would describe more as a, uh, a user story, really high level. And then you break it down to the really specific instances of a use case. So, for example, mm -hmm. Tom should not be able to edit Mary's password. I can yep. work off that. So. Yeah, you know what I love about this as, as I'm processing it through, too, mm -hmm. is it, it's it, what, what a fantastic way to get everybody together on the same page. You know, we talk a lot about visualization because if you can go to the whiteboard and draw it up and then point at it, you're all talking about the same thing. And what you're saying is, yeah, yeah, broad's fine, but useless, which I would tend to agree with you. But the minute we're talking about the app that's in front of <laughs> us and you can say, well, well, hold on. What command did you exit, you know, enter or, or tell me, talk me through the steps that you got to to do that. Suddenly you understand, I understand we're talking the same language. And so what's really cool is there's an investment of time on the part of security to understand what the functionality is supposed to be. And then we get to apply our experience to it. So, Mike, it comes down to a corny joke that I, I read the other day about <laughs> programmers, right? Oh so programmer's wife asks him to pick up a loaf of bread. And if they have eggs, get a dozen. The programmer <laughs> comes home with a dozen loaves of bread. I mean, that pretty much sums up how programmers <laughs> think, right? Uh, very, very procedural. It goes into your date field, right? Yeah. Well, how, how should I structure my date field? Exactly. <laughs> what, was the other, what was the other one that I saw the other day? Uh, wife asked his pro her programmer husband to stop at the store and get a get a half gallon of milk, and he never came home. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yep. Exactly. Oh, yeah. All right. So let me ask the second part of the question. And boy, I tell you, entropy ain't when it used to be. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I couldn't help. Wow. <laughs> it, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of a two-parter. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in the past, in fact, I'll kind of work into it, is I, I can, I still have nightmares, probably, of of coming in as security a year after development to realize that, you know, so I'm going to date myself, goes back to like an NT box, but it was unpatched, it was wide open, it had been hardened, n not in the slightest, but the developers had already built all the custom code on top of that. And so we, we were kind of hamstrung <coughs> for what to do. Is there something that either we, c I mean, I, I, I know that it would be nice to say, oh, well, that doesn't happen anymore, but I don't think that that's accurate. So mm -hmm. when it comes to development, it, it, Whose responsibility is that? I mean, do you guys, is there a check at the beginning of a project to say, hey, what are we building on? Is this a good foundation? Should we go ask somebody? Do we need to be more proactive about that on the other side of the fence? Like, how, how would you, A, is it still a challenge? And B, what do we need to think about to solve it? I mean, from the organization perspective, it's we have developers, preferably already have some people in-house, or we're going to hire some people based on our existing infrastructure, et cetera. So nine times out of 10, it's going to be, what do we know? That's really what it comes down to. You know, if they, they most likely know .NET, if they're using NT, um, or they're using some kind of packages that are Windows specific. So um, as far as trying to get a large organization, even a small organization, to use more secure, you know, Unix, Ubuntu, Red Hat, et cetera, that's a huge push. Um, it oh can yeah, be done. no, it, it's a good point. No, I, I, you know what, I'm good with with. Uh, they go, hey, we know uh, whatever, and we're going to use it. But then there's still a, a period. Uh, you know, again, guys, I mean, maybe I'm I'm really dating myself here, but there's still a method by which we should go through something and say, hey, so how are you guys going to use this? And let's let's harden this box down a little bit. Let's remove some of the unnecessary services. Let's let's close some of the things. Let's make sure it's up to date before you guys start developing on it. Um, is that still something we need to be concerned about? And if so, does that become a check at the beginning of a development project? Because I think one of the concerns that security people voice frequently is, we've got secure builds, but people don't, let, don't tell us. Or they just start mm -hmm. building, we, we didn't get involved in the process. And so I wish I could say, well, if we gave it to you, would you use it? But I guess the question more from a development side is, does anybody, I mean, from a, from a very base perspective, does anybody think at the beginning of a project to say, Hey, is there anything we should write? We we know what we know. Is there anything mm. we should do to this platform before we start building on it? For the most part, I'd say lightly. Again, it depends on the organization. Mm. Um, some of them will say, like you just mentioned, you know, they have that uh, approved secure build. But again, it comes down to what the developers want to use. What are they familiar with? Um, yeah, it's nice. I've been seeing a lot more SE Linux coming out. 
um, people locking that down. Mm. Um, for the most part, it's the security. What's that like to build on, though? That's got to be a pain in the ass. It's the configuration that gets you. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I don't do that one, but <laughs> let's just say it's taken me a very long time to get an environment. Um, but no, again, it was very secure. So, so secure it would help me back sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a balance there. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, but, it's hard. You know, she said. You, maybe I'm being too literal, but when you guys talk about that, I, I, to me, it's not so much about the platform, right? The operating system <clears throat> platforms pretty much got their act together um, these days in terms of regular patch cycles and and um, hardening the system is is not normally how somebody's going to hack an application. The application is going to be hacked on its actual. Uh, application behavior. It's going to be hacked on, you know, uh, on things like leaving configuration files lying around with uh, credentials in them, uh, on, you know, on things like, um, you know, uh, some sort of overflow or, or some sort of uh, injection so vulnerability. So is hardening, so that's, the box that's not, is hardening the box less important now, John? Yeah, hardening the box is still important, but it's, but it, that hygiene um, in, in terms of, um, A, first of all, patching it, uh, and then B, in terms of out-of-the-box hardening, has is, is gotten a whole lot better than it used to be. Mm. Right? Everything's migrated up the stack. The, the, real, the real security problems are uh, in the hygiene of, of, of the, the code base itself once it's deployed, right? So the testing ought to be done, in my opinion, um, as part of the software development lifecycle and, and in the test and, and QA cycle. So basically you're saying that a lot of the, uh, you know, consistent and more common attacks are the top layer of the OSI model. Yep, that's exactly what I'm saying. So basically, you're more likely to get topped than bottomed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nice. I, maybe. I nice. don't know. I don't agree. I think it's more evenly split than what Joff describes. I think there's a lot of configuration in the platform that can get you owned just as, maybe just as much in certain circumstances as... Default the configs, app. default passwords. Yeah, I mean, that's... I think so default passwords, like you just said, are probably more common than yeah. any kind of application bug. Yeah, but, well, so where, but where, l l let's take a, a, a legitimate example. Um, you deploy Tomcat, and you have a default password in Tomcat of admin admin or something like that. Where is that? That's not operating system. That's Tomcat. Yeah, but right? it's still That's on the platform. It's still on the platform that your application is running on. Maybe we need to split it, it is, applications right, so into different levels. We're splitting hairs, which I don't have, but um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the problem is that we're wow, trying to generalize <laughs> everything into one single problem when it is not one single problem. Mm. An, an infrastructure is broken up into a lot of different components, and each component needs to be secure differently and has a different risk matrix that you can actually go in and say, this piece of equipment, it's attacked this way. This, have, this type of application is attacked this way. This type of infrastructure, cloud, local, virtualized, is attacked this other way. Uh, there, there's mm. no one single way that we can say, oh, this has to be secure this way, and the major problem is this one, because it won't apply. Each different component it needs to be secured differently. Exactly. You've got to focus that, on the whole system. Exactly. Listen to and Carlos that's coming in like the voice of reason. And that's and when you actually... Carlos is right again. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for chiming in, Carlos. Well, yeah, and, and, Please and here's continue my takeaway from in. it then that, that I think is kind of important, which is it's a conversation point. So if mm -hmm. you're a developer listening to this, something to ask at the beginning of the project is, hey, did we talk to the security guys? Is there something we need to know? And, you know, if you got to cherry pick the person you talk to because they seem to get it, that's probably a good sign. Flip side, security guys and women need to get better at, at being available to the development teams to say, hey, let me show you some neat tricks. Hey, let's talk, let's talk about this and, and what I picked up from Apollo so far is mm -hmm. and, and come with some real stories. So instead of being like, you need to be hardened on that boss, right? And as Carlos said, like some laundry list of stuff that may or may not apply. Hey, let me throw some scenarios at it, you guys. Mm -hmm. And you tell me if any of these trip your triggers and make you concerned. Hey, oh, okay, cool, cool. Then we'll go and we'll talk about that. Now, so, Apollo, if I came to developers with a case of Red Bull and donuts, <laughs> would, that, would that help my case? It might. It, it might. might. I, I it's a good say, chance though, that it would, right? If you bring some craft beer and some whiskey, they're a little more likely to listen to you. There you nice. go. And, there you and go. not only that, Paul, the, the thing is that you have to talk their language. Yes. One of the problems that you will see with many security people is that they're tool monkeys. Mm. They don't know how to code. <laughs> they don't know how to actually talk to a developer. On the same side, when you also talk with a developer, Many times they won't have the knowledge on, on infrastructure or DevOps, uh, 
you, you tell them, oh, we're going to use Chef to manage all of the servers and make sure that they're configured the same way. They're going to go like, who's going to be cooking? What do you make it? It's like recently I was talking with uh, several guys that dedicate themselves to cloud. I, I, I won't mention their, uh, who they are. But they were talking about Docker. And they were saying, mm -hmm. no, no, we set up our containers and they're working perfectly. We give them to the DevOps guys. They push the containers up and they're over there. They don't need to worry about anything. Everything's in the container and going like, and when did you build those containers? Oh, we built them about a year and a half ago. Hmm. And like, uh... So I saw a good tweet recently. It was saying, uh, you know, if Docker isn't your solution, then the question's wrong. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, you have, so you have a problem, nice. and then you use Docker, and now you have two problems. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> No. Yeah, let me, yeah, and, let me, and that's you ever had a shell learn. inside of a Docker container? It's kind of fun. Yeah, it's, <laughs> me, it's interesting. Let me let me chime in on something real quick because I I want to agree with Echo and then slightly pivot off of something Carlos said in terms of speaking somebody else's language. Mm. I'm seeing that all the time now. If you're presenting to the board, you got to speak their language, and if you're, spe you're mm. sp speaking to the developer, you got to speak their language. Um, guys, it, they're they're not even dialects. It, what we're saying is more colloquially. We need to have a mutual level of understanding. But, mm. I, but I, I just want to suggest it's a, it's a bit of a misnomer to always say, yeah, go speak their language. No, no, it's okay if you don't speak their language. But, but, but the, the nuance to it is make sure that you guys are talking about the same thing. And, and so, again, like what, what Apollo says, hey, use a use case, use an example. Um, other things that work really well, go to the whiteboard. Be mm -hmm. in a physical proximity. Share a session where you can see each other on video if you're remote. And, and acknowledge that, hey, I know we might do some stuff different. I know you guys might do some stuff different. Let's figure out what we know together, and let's make sure that we have an understanding. That's, it's, it's, it's actually simple as that. So I, it's... Uh, it's a good it's a good suggestion it's good advice but now that i'm seeing it so often and so much it's like you know for the last decade the answer to communication was you know communicate effectively what's that mean i don't know uh, let's do this let's over communicate what's that mean <laughs> you know, so, so the point is it's just it's just recognize that your context and experience may be different than theirs you might be using different jargon if you both set that aside you you'll get where you need to be that's it and not, not only that you exactly. need to have a common foundation yes with the person that you're talking with, and and that, and there is a kind of like a a bridge that you have to cross, where a lot of people just go, I learned this skill, I learned it well, this is all I need, and they don't keep studying and advancing themselves and trying to learn other stuff, it's because right now in technology things just change. In, in security, you won't find a guy that is. Uh, a guy that has a lot of coverage and is also very deep on everything. Yeah, you I mean, that's just possible. You, you need to, to change and have specialists, mm -hmm. especially when you're yep. dealing with uh, some probably some boutique security companies won't be able because they don't have the manpower. But you should strive to at least have somebody who is very good in Windows. You need to have a project manager. Let the project manager worry on how he's going to talk with management and different parts Carlos, and I think have I, your specialists. I think I hear a project manager in the background. Did yeah, you hear that? Oh. just back. <laughs> <laughs> did, I, did I say that out loud? Sorry. You know what, too, then? You know, Carlos brings up another fascinating and, and a wonderful point. If you don't know something, don't BS people. Uh, mm -hmm. Stop it. People will see through it, and then they won't believe. So, it, so, it, and that goes for anything. So, if a developer asks you a question and you don't know the answer, don't don't BS your way through it. Just say it's a great question. I, Be genuine. You know, instead of, and instead of going, I don't know, and then you know, walk away. Just say, I don't know. Let me go find the right person. Let's exactly. go figure it out together, right? I mean, those are opportunities. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't expect a developer. Actually, I expect developers to know everything. Well, I'm not <laughs> but. Uh, um, but yeah, so Michael, to your point earlier, how do you really effectively communicate? Um, that, you know, that's just kind of humanity 101. That's, you know, <laughs> I, I used to read a lot of philosophy. I like really studying Greek philosophy. Um, and one of the most important rhetoric techniques is, you know, you find the shared values. You know, yeah. I guarantee that, you know, between the devs, the ops, security, QA, we have things, we have problems that we're trying to solve. And we have something that we're both trying to solve. So that's, that's an easy bridge right there. And aspirations. We, we always focus on the afflictions. Don't mm -hmm. forget, aspirations are equally powerful. So Paul really focuses, on, focuses on the ass a lot. <laughs> What's in my name? <laughs> there you go. So, 
Um, so the next layer above that is, you know, you look at adding business value, however you want to define that. So let's look at something like a really specific example. <coughs> my server's running slow. Hey, Paul, my server's running slow. It's, it's got to be the firewall. It's got to be the network. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. Just a simple little question like that. It, it gets a dialogue going between different people. Um, and it gives you a chance to kind of look around. So if I said, hey, my server's kind of slow, well, that's a chance for you to kind of go in there and look at it. You know, you can be, ideally, most people would, that would see that would say, oh, well, maybe you can help me solve the problem right now and fix it. But you could find so many other things to help fix that. You know, you can say, oh, well, maybe the firewall is running slow. Maybe it's misconfigured. You know, maybe we have this extra service running there that shouldn't be there. Um, that's more of like a, sys, like a sysop kind of thing. But it just, it gets you communicating, gets you talking together. And what's crazy is if you want to take this a step further and be awesome is, hey, show me how to do, you know, load balancing. Show me how to actually go through and hammer my server with something like Apache AB or JMeter. Mm. You know, what, what is DDoS? You, you reminded me of a joke um, when you said philosophy. Five, five Romans walk into a bar and says, I'll have five beers. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> wow. Get it? Mm -hmm. Roman? No. Wow. No my, my, gran my grandpa called and he says he wants his joke back. <laughs> That's perfect. That's awesome. That's awesome. Wow. Paul, well, well, you haven't been out much lately, have you? No, I haven't. <laughs> I read this article on nerd jokes, and they some of them stuck with me. Maybe that's, you'll hear more before the one. end of the show. I'll begrudgingly say that's a good one. Begrudgingly. So, Paulo, let's, let's talk about uh, authentication. Okay, yep. How often have you found yourself in situations where you would love to, to just pull code and incorporate it so you didn't have to think about authentication, you didn't have to think about encryption, you didn't have to think about privileges or authorization, but either you can't find it, it doesn't work, you don't know to trust it. I mean... Hey, Carlos, looks different. Are you in my cybers, Michael? Have you been looking at my cybers? <laughs> I have Ooh, no have comment. It's, it's just metadata. It's okay. It's... <laughs> It's nothing uh, important there. So, I, I, again, I follow a lot of interesting things on Twitter. One of them is uh, Gonzo Hacker. Really okay. funny, sarcastic things. He said, I certainly hope the dev team finds a good tutorial because our entire system is going to be based on it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously. <coughs> the first thing I do is I say, okay, what's the programming language? What's the database? What are we going to use for the stack? So, again, I use Python and Flask. And then the first thing I do is say, Flask auth. Do we have a Flask auth library? Oh, we do. All right, cool. We're going to use that. So that's what most developers do. They say they just go to Google, type in a search, and see hopefully there's a library from the core company. Um, it's a good reason why you choose large frameworks like Django, you know, like um, Springs and Struts and Saturday Ruby on Rails. So most of us will say whatever is the default, you know, package system, we're just going to pull that in mm. for good or bad. And, and, yep. and, and since I manage several developers, here is where we come in on do you have a coding guideline? Do you have a set of best practices that you're going to follow? Does your QA team know those and do they actually enforce those? For example, when you mention encryption, does QA actually know, hey, these are the things that we need to test to make sure that encryption is done properly. They need to use, use this random number generator. They need to do, uh, they should always use AES this way. They should always use SHA-256. Uh, you need to have those uh, guidelines preset before the project actually starts. Carlos, Everybody who builds those? Everybody needs to be in the same page. Is that, that, do, you, do you expect the security team to build those, the dev team? Is that a collaboration? It should be a collaboration. Hmm. And then it, it, it gets hand off to your QA team, and, and then it goes part SD. Uh, software development process. So for the your, most part... Your, your QA team should actually have security people inside of it. Mm. So part of our procedure is, these are our, our guidelines. After the project, or the, the several uh, first iterations of the project, you should actually go in and say, hey guys, do we need to modify the process any way, shape, or form? And then you get that feedback. You go back <clears throat> into Jira, Redmine, whatever, and you go through the tickets, you go through the notes, and then you go, okay, we should probably modify this and we should probably fix this. Oh, we're seeing that when QA bumps stuff back to us in the issues, we're seeing that it's for this specific stuff that we're missing here. Should we probably have a static analyzer uh, or a Git hook in there that will actually go in and check this stuff? Automate it as, mo as much as possible. Mm. So you're grabbing all of that low-hanging fruit 
and just quickly eliminating it out of the uh, equation. Yeah, good organizations, that's what they do. You know, when they're doing the requirements, requirements <coughs> gathering, they pull in security. So yeah, we I have seen well, so those. So how, all right, so I, I get that we say it's good organizations, this is the right way to do it, it's proper. Mm. And yet, well, looking at all the freaking headlines that keep coming out, we're not doing it. So uh, does that mean most organizations aren't good? Or or <laughs> ding, where, ding, ding, I ding, mean, ding. like, what's the solution here? <laughs> <laughs> I think so, you answered your own question. The, there. <laughs> the, the, the problem I see it is that's human nature. We will always screw up. We will always fuck up. And we'll always go for the easiest route. And all organizations are made up by humans. That will happen. Uh, for example, I'm supposed to be on, on, on diet. I have problems with my gallbladder recently. And from you time to sexy. time, I'll, uh, I'll, you I'll sn <laughs> thank you. I'll sneak up to the uh, Chinese place and I'll go, hey, give me a lo mein, and I want it to be for uh, pork. And then that night, I'm paying the price. Uh, same thing you'll see with uh, uh, organizations. They'll take shortcuts. When pressure comes in, hey, dude, uh, product managers are famous for this. Hey. I promise uh, the big guys upstairs that we're going to have this for next month. And you're going like, what? Mm -hmm. So this when? almost sounds like it's no, a challenge of product product discipline and that. routine, right? Because, I mean, what you're talking about at the human nature level is discipline and willpower. And, and those things are always bolstered by routine. And so, it, you know, it's at odd. It almost feels like it, it comes back to having better use cases and, and better case studies that say, hey, when you build this stuff up front, you don't actually go slower, you go faster. You have less defects, you have less time in QA, mm, you build yep. better products. So maybe and we're it, not making that case well enough. Yeah, but we're, we're a results-driven society, Mike. We want, yeah, the product true. manager needs that because the business has to make money. not only that, you actually need to have that culture and that even uh, into your hiring process. Mm. So it's Way a leadership challenge, again. Yeah, it, 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 yeah. Well, uh, for example, all of my guys in my team, they're, um, a type personalities. <laughs> Sometimes that's great. They strive for perfection. They strive to things to be well. But when it comes to getting them to work with one another, it's kind of challenging. I need to kind of balance different personalities for stuff to be uh, to get done. Same as with an organization. When you're hire hiring people, are they willing to learn on their own, or are they the type of person that go, nope, I have seniority. I don't need to learn that. I've been here 12 years. It's all how do you manage that team, that personality, and it kind of goes into the technical side. Uh, th that's why many times when I see discussions in security and panels, oh, no, we need to find a solution for all of this. I'm going, the problem is very complex. There's a lot of different moving parts, hmm. and a lot of them are very small that you need to get right, and then you need to have kind of buffers and kind of play with stuff. It will never be perfect. There will, there will always be a problem. That's why we'll always be employed. That's why doctors will always be employed. Same with police. That's why they will always be employed. Mm. Same with security professionals. Mm -hmm. yep. So let's just go, I'm gonna go on like a, like a conceptual journey for a sec. Um, I work at big corporate bank, you know, Sapphire Bank, whatever. Well, we have the, they have the money, they have the time, they have the priorities, they know they need to do security. They're gonna do it. They're gonna spend the money, they're gonna buy the static analyzers, they're gonna waft their DAF with their SAS and think about IAST. They're gonna do that. You have, you've said that before, that was beautiful. Thanks. <laughs> wow, that really was fantastic. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I put that one up on Twitter at Gary and he, uh, he appreciated it. <laughs> Mr. McGraw. Um, but yeah, so you look at you know, the other 90% of, uh, of uh, software that's being built out there. You know, budget's part of the problem. You know, we can't all go out there and afford to use, you know, Coverity and Sigital and, you know, Veracode, as good as those products are. Okay. That's just the reality. I can't afford to spend 10 grand a month to buy these products. We should. It should be a priority. We should all be doing that. But for now, today, that's not happening. Mm. So what can we do? Well, you can use open source. So how far can we get with open source? We can actually get pretty far, I'd say. Um, yeah, and, and, and you'll find it many times, like, Many, uh, I'll go to customers and they'll go, well, I, I was hacked, and go into their event viewer and say, here, I see how it happened, okay, they got in, hey, they did this, I saw this service was created, I saw this account was changed, I saw this user was created, and they go, whoa, how did you saw that? And go like, don't you know your own tools? You, you know that the OS can log all of that stuff, and mm -hmm. you can actually configure it to log processes so you know when something started, was when it was ended and you Windows, you can actually do 
centralized logging, you can have all of your machines send their logs to one centralized Windows server and all, and you can track them all. Dude, no way. No. And, and that's the problem. They don't know their own tools. When you have somebody, mm. a DevOps guy, a security guy that actually knows how to script and automate and, and do a bit of coding, they can do miracles if they're, they have the right personality, they're very well motivated, and you actually give them enough leeway for them to astonish you. Uh, as you mentioned, open source can be there, mm -hmm. but if you don't have the person that's willing to actually go in, learn that tool, modify it, and hey, I don't know Ruby, let me learn Ruby, let me find a couple of tutorials. And that's the thing to too. Learn. A lot of you, really you good developers, they, they love to learn stuff, you know? I, yep. I teach myself Redis, you know, I learn, I taught myself how to use Vagrant on the weekend. So, you know, a lot of developers and I think just people in general in IT, they like to learn these new systems. Mm -hmm. um, great way to get into it. It's not just a job, it's a hobby. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm hearing though too, and I'm, I'm really encouraged by this, is that we keep pretending that we have these gaps, that we're operating in silos. And, and what I'm hearing is, no, we're actually not that far apart. We, we have pressures, the way that we're incentivized, how much we need to get done, how much time we have to do it. Those things tend to contribute to it. But so what it sounds like is if we more frequently found ways, even informally, to get together to learn these things. I mean, you know, I, I think Carlos raised a, a point about the, you know, you don't even know your tool. And I'm just sitting here thinking about the number of people who once they learn how to get to the result that they want, that's that's the groove that they walk. That's and of, mm. of course, they don't know how their tool works. But I think you could expand it to any number of people in any number of places. And so what a great opportunity to actually start teaching each other these little tricks. I mean, man, if somebody's good at, at scripting, that benefits everybody. If somebody can mm. pull data that, that they can share, that's good with everybody. It's almost like sometimes we got to take a deep breath and say, okay, same team. How do I help you, right? It's, I mean, you know, let, let's, go, uh, let's go 80s motivational for a second. Zig Ziglar, his, one of my favorite quotes of his is, you can get anything in life you want if you help enough other people get in life what they want. That's and nice. it seems like maybe if we can go to each other and say, hey, I'm a developer. I got some free time. I'd love to learn some more security. Maybe there's something I can contribute. Maybe there's something I can volunteer. Flip side, hey, I'm in security. I don't know how to code, which is exactly right. That's a true statement on my part. Mm. Um, but what can I do? How can I, you know, I can communicate. I can help do the case studies. I know how to think about stuff differently. What, what I think maybe if we just approach each other that way more often, uh, we might actually figure out there's not a lot of gaps. So two things. Um, what you guys mentioned earlier, you know, instrumentation and monitoring stuff. Mm -hmm. Nagios, Snort, teach people that log stash, open source, free. It's a good starting point. Is it the best enterprise level? God, no. no. But hey, hey let me ask you, let me ask you uh, a, a somewhat naive question, mm. um, but you know, to just pretend I'm with management. Yep. Uh, if, if I start with open source stuff, but I'm starting with the mindset of, how do I test this? How do I define it? How do I build it? And then, oh, it, it works. Now it's commercially viable, and I have a better budget. Can I go to the better paid, more extensive solutions later? Like, if I design with that in mind, can I migrate to that stuff later? Or I would think so, yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, again, it comes back to, we talked a little, a little earlier about, you know, the idea of the process we're following. If you can have develop, if you can have, you know, uh, just, again, way before you even start writing a line of code, talk about how are we going to approach the problem. And we get everyone, including security, to be part of that, and preferably using open source tools and saying, hey, every single time you do a code push, we're going to run Nessus. We're going to run Static Analyzer. We're going to run a port scanner. Then you can kind of build that into the process. Again, open source, free, simple, easy, automated. And that's really the key right there. If you can get that going, you know, is it going to solve all your problems? God, no. But it's, really, it's better than nothing. No, but it's a mindset. That's what I'm so, liking about it, right? It's it's a yeah. it's a mindset. Hey, let me let me demonstrate some value to you. Let's learn what we can learn, uh, and then as uh, as you see that it's more valuable, it, it also makes those later investments. Because you know, I think a lot of times, I mean, I, I'm listening to some of this, and I don't have the experience you guys have, and I'm listening to some of these names and just scratching my head, saying, who named these things? <laughs> <laughs> what do they possibly do? Yeah, but I've been in this industry for 20 years, and so I'm yeah. familiar with the names. But if you asked me to tell you what they did, I, I couldn't possibly tell you. So now if you came to me and said, hey, I need 20 grand for this, I'm going to go, for what? Yeah, that's the, thing. It comes the down value to of that. What's 20 grand for cucumbers? What? <laughs> well, but so, What's so the problem? take that a, What's the take problem that trying a step to solve? 
Sure. And what well, solutions? I, you just hit my absolute favorite question to ask. What's the problem we're trying to solve? But then the second part, the answer has to be, how does this solution solve that problem? Mm. And it has to be translated into some functionality that I understand. Yep. And and we we don't... We don't do that. We don't do that well, but that's mostly because we don't invest the time to do that because we don't have the time, et cetera. But what I love about this is if you start with something that's open source or something that's a lower cost mm -hmm. and you start to embed it into the process, then you can say, well, here, let me show you. And once they see it, you come back to that common foundation. They go, oh, oh, you meant that? Well, that seems really important to me. Oh, you want, oh, so you can get something different for 20 grand? Yeah, well, that's fine. We got money for that. Yeah, exactly. Right? I'm not that, saying that, it's going to work that, doesn't that way always every time. Work. Yeah, it doesn't always yeah. work because I've been in that exact situation <laughs> and it and, didn't and, work. And, but. and that's when you will see uh, understanding the problem. It, every company, every team has a different problem mm -hmm. if you ask them. And that's when implementing those kinds of solutions, you're getting ahead with them. And when then you look at vendor X with their shiny box or their shiny software with all of the bells and whistles, you can and you go through it, you go, I already do this, 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 and this. And if I script this in Bash, I probably can do this. Mm -hmm. And I don't need this box. So empowering your own users to have that knowledge and also have the freedom to experiment and do that kind of stuff. Because many organizations go like, nope. If it, I cannot buy it from a vendor and get a support contract, we're not doing that. Yes, yeah, so you got to make go sure like, let me give you you have to make sure that their software makes the world a better place. That's one of the key requirements. <laughs> you know what I really? And speaking like, of favorite questions, yeah. Mike's favorite question was, well, "Why why do we need to solve that problem?" Right. Mm -hmm. What problem, uh, what, are we what, to what solve? problem are we trying to solve? It is his favorite question. He has that all the time. I've noticed. Well, <laughs> one of my favorite <laughs> questions is in the five questions that I'm about to ask you, Apollo, which you've been listening to the show. Yep. You already know these questions, and you probably He's know. Have really artful answers, I bet. You probably know which one of the five is my favorite. So, uh, with that, three words to describe yourself: uh, curious, um, creative, and foolish. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? I actually have it right here. Whoa. Look out, Larry. Hold on, it's in my pocket, so it's kind of big. So better step back. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, nice done on you have slide. been watching the show. Oh, there we go. Okay, there it goes. Mm -hmm. A sommelier's wine knife. Oh, very nice. According very to nice. the TSA. You got some options there, too. According to TSA, this is a dangerous weapon. Mm. So, I don't know. I feel like uh, one and a half inches. Is that, is that enough for you, Paul? One and a half inches? It's it's more than more enough. Than, more than enough. I mean, if you give him one and a half inches twice, that's three inches, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's so. got the the corkscrew. That was in a Steven Seagal movie. What was it? <laughs> Out for Justice. Uh, if you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Holy shit, that happened. <laughs> in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Both. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Jean-Paul Sartre, the existentialist French philosopher, mm. and Audrey Hepburn. Very wow. nice. Wow, someone what? without a no, breast no complex. Angel no Angelina. <laughs> <laughs> no Angelina Jolie or Chuck Norris. Audrey, Hep <laughs> Audrey Hepburn could dance. <coughs> Hell yeah. That, so. So you, you know what I really liked about that segment? The <laughs> fact that we could actually see Carlos. Yes. And you know what else I liked? That no, I am not the only one with a box of Pampers in my office. <laughs> 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 How do you think he sits at his desk for so long, Barry? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to talk about your adult diapers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right. Well, I, with I, that, I'm doing like Dave Kennedy. You get, you only get to see the top. <laughs> nice. So with that, <clears throat> we're gonna take a short break, mix up some more cocktails, come back. Stay tuned. Bash command line tips. Coming. Just the, just the tips. Just the tip. Maybe even talk about Scream. I don't know. <laughs> That'd be awesome. We'll be right back. Up. 